pure scenic splendor, the transcontinental North Coast Limited was equaled only by the California Zephyr. Both roads sent immaculate scenic dome streamliners racing from Chicago to the coast across the mountain ranges of the west. Five years after the Northern Pacific, the Great Northern chose a 75-mile shorter route through much more difficult terrain. To, become to head off the advancing Milwaukee, the Northern Pacific and the Great Northern joined forces in 1908 and captured the north shore of the Columbia. Ironically, the Milwaukee, the last to cross the Cascades in 1909, got the best pass, Snoqualmie. Grades were easier and tunnels larger, but the Milwaukee abandoned Snoqualmie in 1980 and the tracks were torn up in 1987. After thundering on the locked doors of Puget Sound for almost 30 years, the Union Pacific was given trackage rights as far as Tacoma by the NP in 1908. In 1864, when Abraham Lincoln gave the charter for a second transcontinental railroad to the Northern Pacific, he specified that the rails be laid from the tip of Lake Superior to Puget Sound. In the early days, the North Coast Limited was handled by double-heading ten-wheelers on the west slope. Later, these were replaced by Pacifics. The direct route west ran smack into two major obstacles, the crossing of the Columbia River and the ascent of the Cascade Range. With a short detour to the south, however, they could hook up with a railroad that already occupied the south bank of the Columbia, and presto, they had a water-level route to the Pacific Ocean. With this scenario in mind, they quickly ran a line south from Tacoma to the Columbia's north shore near Portland. In 1947, the first F units were used on the North Coast Limited. This rare Kodachrome was made of what appears to be the North Coast Limited not long after the first diesel units were placed in service. On August 29, 1900, when the first North Coast Limited headed west, it was the first all-electrically lighted train in America. It carried the first dining cars and sleepers from St. Paul to the Northwest. In fact, it advertised itself as the dining car line. In July 1945, the Northern Pacific placed its first order for streamlined, lightweight passenger cars with the Pullman Company. 18 sleepers, 6 sleeper observations. The order was delivered in 1948. In 1954, the Bud Company delivered Vista Dome sleepers and coaches. Construction from Portland to Tacoma began on the north shore of the river at Kalama in 1870 and reached Tacoma, the railroad's western headquarters and final terminus, in 1873. For lack of funds, it stopped there, and passengers who insisted on going further could ride the narrow gauge to Seattle. In 1908, the Columbia was finally bridged by the SPNS at Portland. And in 1909, the Northern Pacific agreed to share its tracks to what had become Seattle with both the Union Pacific and the Great Northern. The three pooled their resources and came up with four passenger trains a day. The Union Pacific and the Northern Pacific considered their Portland-Seattle trains as an extension of through trains. The morning train carried a through car for Chicago on the UP streamliner city of Portland. Four streamlined Pullmans for the Southern Pacific Cascade to San Francisco were attached to the afternoon train. The Union Pacific contributed the General Motors All-Dome Train of Tomorrow 
to the pool and boasted about astrodome diners, parlor cards, and observation cards. In their own timetables of pool trains at that time, neither the Northern Pacific nor the Great Northern made any mention of dome cars, let alone trains of tomorrow. Despite the fact that much of the consist of the North Coast Limited was modernized after World War II, Northern Pacific management continued with a traditional view of passenger service. They held tenaciously to their 48-hour St. Paul, Seattle schedule, claiming that there were just too few passengers to justify the wear, tear, and expense of a speed-up. There was safety and comfort in a stately Victorian timetable. Their competitors laughed quietly to themselves. In 1947, both the Milwaukee and the Great Northern got brightly painted brand new streamlined equipment and both put a firecracker under the gentleman's agreement to a 48-hour schedule. They lit the fuse on a 39 and a half hour cannon cracker and tossed it smack in the middle of what the Northern Pacific considered its own private enclave, the Northwest. It was bad enough to have the Union Pacific thumb their nose at schedule tradition with their bright yellow cigar tube, the city of Portland. Here, right in their own compound, the Great Northern and Milwaukee were up to the same sort of mischief. Between the two, they set out to eat the Northern Pacific's lunch. And boy, did they succeed. Within four years, the Great Northern purchased another six entirely new, complete sets of Empire Builder cars, Pullmans, coaches, full-length domes, diners, the works, and used the original, still almost brand new, six sets of streamlined trains to replace their secondary train equivalent to the Main Streeter, and christened it the Western Star. On October 16, 1952, the times of all the Northern Pacific transcontinental passenger trains were slashed. At last, the North Coast Limited was given a competitive 39 and a half hour schedule to St. Paul, Seattle. The consist was frozen. No set outs for Red Lodge, Cody, or Gardner. Four new dome cars per train. The train was renumbered from one and two to 25 and 26, and many intermediate stops were eliminated. A newly created train, the Main Streeter, took over the old 48-hour schedule of the North Coast Limited with some 35 scheduled stops between St. Paul and Seattle, and over 100 stops if all conditional and flag stops were counted. It became numbers one and two. The Harlequin colored train shown here was probably not the North Coast Limited. Before World War II and for a short while following, some large travel agencies chartered their own trains and toured the scenic high points of the West. This train, with Pennsylvania, Union Pacific, and Burlington cars, may have been one of the Finley Tours, Finley Fun Time Trains. Double tracking in 1913 brought about abandonment of tunnels one and two on the east slope and five and six on the west. The rails narrowed to a single track to get through the short tunnel, number four, and Stampede Tunnel, number three, just a short way beyond. Initially, a staff system was used to control operation of trains through the tunnels. Automatic block signals with their well-known upper quadrant semaphores were used throughout the rest of the system. Later, a CTC board was installed at Easton and used to control the line as far as Leicester. When work on the nearly 10,000-foot Stampede Pass Tunnel began, it was expected to take two years to complete. The tracks, however, soon were finished to either end of the hole. The railroad was eager for the rewards that Congress had promised upon completion. So the builders kept right on going across the very tops of the mountain, some 1,000 feet above the tunnel itself. When completed a year later, 
the seven mile bypass had 30 trussels, a rolling grade of 5.6% and multiple switchbacks. This is the start of the first switchback on the east side. The main line comes across the trussle from Martin. The line over the summit branches to the left. The Northern Pacific purchased its first two rotaries for use across the switchbacks. A single train at a time climbed each side. Notice that the last three of the six locomotives were facing backwards. This was intentional. As the trains sawed their way back and forth, through the switchbacks. The lead locomotive was always facing forward. Freights were limited to five cars. In some of the sawing process was easy, but winter was something else. Snowfall at Martin averages 300 inches in a normal winter, the equivalent of 25 feet. For use across the switchback line, the Northern Pacific had two special locomotives built, two 10 O's with water brakes. Probably the only water brake on an American locomotive anywhere except on the Rio Grande. Stampede Tunnel was poorly ventilated because it rose to a high point in the middle. Exhaust gases and smoke collected here. Engine crews sometimes lost consciousness and some suffocated. Blowers were eventually installed. In 1939, they briefly entertained the idea of cab forwards. A Z6 articulated was sent to coma shops and a special smokestack installed. When the engine was run forward through the tunnel, temperatures in the cab rose to 130 degrees. When it backed through, temperatures fell to 80 degrees. Clearances were so tight, however, that the crews were trapped in the cab and had no means of escape in the event of an accident. beaver tail, so-called because its shape resembled a real beaver tail, was the product of an inexorable force, slow, steady erosion. When the cannonade from Washington's north-south line of active volcanoes died down, when the layer upon layer of basalt, which the passenger sees here in Yakima Canyon, began to cool, little rivulets began to squirm across the flat surface from the snow and ice high in the new mountains. Soon an uplift began, which may have formed in the Saddle Mountains. To the east, the rivulets which now meandered back and forth were entrenched deeper and deeper by erosion as the hills rose above them. The Beaverdale is one such meander. Starting around the Beaverdale landform, both tracks and river reverse direction. 180 degrees twice. This is the center of the 255 degree curve. The railroad goes two miles to reach a point where a 2500 foot tunnel would have sufficed. At one point, tracks and river are only 1000 feet apart, going in opposite directions. Each separated by a rock wall 400 feet high. The cable bridge is near Umptonum siding. For the next four miles, during spring and fall, bighorn sheep can be seen on the slopes to the right.
Yakima is the Indian name for black bear. The city was of such importance to the interior of Washington that in the heavyweight era, a Pullman sleeper was attached to the eastbound North Coast Limited every night to be set out at Yakima. The car returned the following night to Seattle on the Alaskan. The verdant Yakima Valley was the center of a vast irrigation district enclosed at either end by desert. From here to Easton, westbound, the train followed the Yakima River for 140 miles, the first 35 at the bottom of the Yakima Canyon. The Yakima Trolley Line, which still operates between Yakima and Sela, is one of the last interurban lines still in operation. But its spiderweb of lines, which once spread north and west of the city, have all but disappeared. The Washington Central, the regional carrier that had purchased much of the Northern Pacific on the east side of the mountains, continued the Clay Elm to Ellensburg segment with hardly any traffic. The 2% grade begins three miles west of Easton at Cabin Creek. In steam days, Easton had a six-stall roundhouse for helper engines. At the turn of the century, they were Mikados and Consolidations. In 1913, however, the Z3-2882 compound mallet became the principal power for freight. The Northern Pacific was the first railroad in America to employ a 484 wheel arrangement. The name Northern was taken from Northern Pacific. What a change from the lumbering, drag-type locomotives that characterized its roster. The 21 Z3 and 4 2882 compound mallets with their 53-inch drivers were limited to 30 miles an hour when traveling light because of the damage they did to the rails. These slow-footed mallets were used in drag freights as head-end power. But the Class A Northerns had 73-inch drivers and could hold 65 miles an hour, smooth as butter, halfway across the continent on grades that sometimes approached 2%. The railroad bought 49 of those in all, the last of which had 77-inch drivers. The NP purchased its largest locomotive, the Z5, 2884 Yellowstone, simple articulated in 1928, eventually building 12 in all. The real winner, however, was their 4664 Challenger, classes Z67 and 8. Purchased between 1936 and 43, they were used for fast freight in World War II. Classes Z24 and 5 never operated west of Helena, Montana. The Z6, 7, and 8s were normally turned at Yakima, but during World War II, they and some of the A-class 484s ran through to Easton before being pulled off and replaced by Z3s. Western Slope had three times the number of foggy days, as did the East. The Cascade Mountains served as weather strainer for the moisture-laden westerlies from the Pacific. Rainfall on the West Slope was double that of the East. The Western Mountain sides were blanketed with luxuriant forests, whereas the East feathered away into desert. On the West Side, winter temperatures ranged from the 20s to 30s. In the East, they were a bitter 10 to 20 degrees.
Situated here in Seattle, the railroad crosses the river, the principal source of Tacoma's water supply, seven times. For this reason, the dirt highway between Leicester and Hanson Dam has always been isolated behind locked gates. Keys were issued only to logging operators, the railroad, and the Tacoma Water Department, with a single exception, an elderly lady, the last surviving private resident of Leicester. Because of the gates, photography of the railroad on the western side of the mountains was possible only after competing for elbow room with the loaded logging trucks careening down the single lane dirt road which crossed Stampede Pass. Tacoma was chosen as the first terminus of the railroad on the Pacific Coast. The original line across the Cascades turned southwest at what is now Palmer Junction to head in the direction of Tacoma. Much of this line is now abandoned. In 1900, a new line was cut from Auburn on the main line south from Seattle to Tacoma, straight west to Palmer Junction. Its use cut 25 miles from the trip across the Cascades. At the outset, there were 12 coal mines on this new shortcut in the Ravensdale area. In 1915, an explosion in one of them killed 43 men. Northern merger, the combined railroad had three passenger lines across Washington. From a passenger load standpoint, the Northern Pacific was clearly the first choice, but passengers were fast disappearing. For that reason, as soon as Amtrak took over passenger service, they switched the Great Northern's Empire Builder to Northern Pacific tracks. But the Burlington Northern then decided to abandon Stampede Pass entirely in favor of the Great Northern's Stevens Pass and had to beg Amtrak to move the Empire Builder back. The Great Northern route was 86 miles shorter. There was one less crew change and no helpers were required. Avalanches in abundance it had, but total snow accumulation was actually less. For 13 years, the Burlington Northern listed the Stampede Line as out of service. But before the snow sheds were destroyed by fire and vandalism, both EMD and General Electric tested new kinds of diesel locomotives between Auburn and Martin. In 1985, when the Great Northern's bridge at Wenatchee caught fire, the line was used for a week to relieve pressure on other BN lines. The Northern Pacific bought what eventually became the Oregon Railway and Navigation System, the water level connection along the south shore of the Columbia. When compared to the Cascade Mountains, it was an easy and very inexpensive route to the sea. Alas, this solution slipped through their fingers when they went bankrupt in the Silver Panic of 1879. Congress had expected the railroad would start laying rail where the waters of Puget Sound lapped the coast. With this in mind, they buttered the railroad's charter with bountiful goodies, thousands and thousands of acres, more accurately, alternating sections of land which eventually amounted to square miles. No one was precisely sure of what was in them, but it turned out to be packed with bountiful natural resources, coal, timber, cropland, and potential real estate bonanzas in future town sites. The Union Pacific believed it could force the NP into giving them access to Seattle, north from near Portland, by raising freight rates. Time was running out on millions, maybe billions worth of goodies. The NP immediately mounted a crash program to conquer the Cascades. It wasn't until the Rockefellers, marching steadily west with their Milwaukee road, 
threatened to build down the north shore of the Columbia, that the Northern Pacific and the Great Northern put their heads and their wallets together and built their jointly owned Spokane, Portland, and Seattle Railroad down the North Shore ahead of the Milwaukee. It may well be that the Northern Pacific decided against Snoqualmie Pass despite its easy access because it took the rails down to Tidewater virtually at Seattle's front door. In the beginning, Seattle was 40 miles north of the first company headquarters in Tacoma. Heavyweight dining cars were used into the streamlined era because they had greater capacity and could be substituted when trains ran long or the North Coast Limited ran in two sections, coach and sleeper. Dining cars with arched windows built in 1915 were often used in the all-coach section. All North Coast Limited diners were air-conditioned. They were provisioned in St. Paul and run to Chicago where they were joined by their crews. The backbone of the all-steel heavyweight sleeper fleet were 37 so-called 10-1-1 Pullmans built in 1930. Each had 10 open sections with upper and lower berths which were heavily curtained at night, plus one drawing room and one compartment. In summertime, the Northern Pacific ran six special sleepers to Yellowstone Park three each from Chicago and Seattle, each via separate routes to Cody, Red Lodge, and Gardner. The Northern Pacific has a branch to the coal fields at Roslyn. Until the opening of huge deposits of clean burning coal in Wyoming, those at Roslyn were the largest west of the Mississippi. The Northern Pacific also had 10 Pullman-built observation cars. Each had a wide window sunroom, barbershop, radio, smoking room, lounge, buffet, shower, and open platform observation deck. Because they didn't carry paying passengers, the government forbid their use during World War II, and all were sold to the Army and converted to hospital cars. Package cars were provided where passengers were offered the unheard of privilege of checking dogs, guns, bicycles, baby carriages without being required to prepackage them. had vast reserves, the largest in the United States, of soft brown lignite coal. It cost them less than 70 cents a ton to produce. 
a fraction of the price of other railroad coals. Burning late night, however, presented problems. The railroad had to design its locomotives with the largest grates in the world. The Northerns had 115 square feet, the Yellowstones 182. In midwinter 1886, the westbound tracks of the Northern Pacific reached Yakma. When the contract was awarded for the tunnel, the builder loaded men and machinery into mule-drawn carts at that point and worked his way, much of it through heavy snow, to the location of the east end of the proposed tunnel. Lewis and Clark camped at Pasco on their way west in 1805. Eastward construction was begun from here in 1879. Between 1885 and 1888, before the bridge was finished, trains crossed the river by ferry. The ferry held nine passenger cars. In 1883, an incline was built on the bank of the Columbia at Kennewick so that construction forces headed west could receive materials by ferry. It's a fruit growing area, and the name is said to be a translation of the Indian word winter paradise. Richland is just to the north, the great atomic city, home of the breeder reactor and developer of one of the three basic types of atomic bombs.
part of this century, Toppenish was noted for its large sugar refinery. It was headquarters for the Yakma Indian Nation and noted for the summer powwow. Portland Union Station was finished in 1896 and is now the last remaining major railway station in the West. You are looking at a genuine Seth Thomas clock made in Connecticut, wound by hand regularly once a week. You see several versions of the combined first class and secondary trains on this Portland connection. In the beginning, the Northern Pacific and Great Northern combined their trains between Portland and Pasco. At Pasco, the Northern Pacific through trains picked up the Northern Pacific cars from Portland, and Great Northern cars were handled alone by the SPNS to Spokane. When this picture was made, there were three passenger trains, one for cars of the first class trains, the North Coast Limited and the Empire Builder, another for the secondary trains, the Main Streeter and the Western Star, and finally, the all stops daytime Spokane, Portland and Seattle train called the Columbia River Express, sometimes Sagebrush Annie. In later years, the Pasco-Spokane portion of this train was switched to Northern Pacific track. But prior to World War II, the steam-powered Columbia River Express ran daily along the very rim of the Snake River Canyon on tracks of the Spokane, Portland, and Seattle. It was the only way to view this astonishing sight in daylight. The tracks have since been torn up. In recent geologic time, at about this point, a huge earth slide blocked the Columbia River. The river is said to have burrowed beneath it, leaving, for a time, a natural bridge across the river. The Cascade, which for many years stopped all navigation above this point on the river, were said to have been caused by the jumble of skyscraper-sized rocks left by the collapse of the natural bridge. Much of the river chaos is now submerged beneath Lake Bonneville. At Lyle, a branch climbed the side of the gorge to Klickitat, the start of the Klickitat Logging Railroad, detailed in Sunday River's Gears in the Woods. The Dallas Dam was completed in 1963. The lake behind it covers the famous Salilo Falls. The SPNS bridge connects to the Great Northern Branch up the Deschutes Canyon and on to California. When the Union Pacific got wind of the fact that the Spokane, Portland, and Seattle planned a line along the north shore of the Columbia to Portland, they immediately revived their dormant small portage railroad around the Cascade Locks on the North Shore. A war between construction crews followed, and each sabotaged the work of the other. The courts quickly ruled in favor of the SPNS.